Hello everybody, welcome back to the James Lawrence Allcott channel and now you are clicking on the right video. You are about to watch The Process, episode 3 with Paul McGregor. We're, we're going to talk about some really difficult and, and tragic things and, and the process that Paul had to go through to to move on with, with his life and, and continues to, to have to sort of undertake to, to move on with his life. And we talk about mental health and we talk about suicide. And I just want to talk to you guys really, really quickly just to get across what I'm trying to do here with the process. An opportunity selfishly for me to learn more about different people's points of view and get across this idea that I'm starting to believe is that there's a million ways to be successful. A lot of people are telling you that their way is the right way. I disagree with that. I think w whatever gets you there, um, hopefully with integrity, is the right way for you to to navigate life and challenges in life. Um, but it's about it's about learning. It's about understanding, and um, it's about finding things that I can use in my life to move forward. But also, hopefully things that you guys can use to move forward in, in your life as well. I want you to know that my intentions are good with this. It's it's someone who doesn't know enough about mental health, looking to understand a little bit more. It's about empathy, it's about understanding. I hope you get something from it. I hope um, you have a better understanding of suicide and mental health at the end of this. Um, if you are struggling with anything, uh, there's a link in the description to Calm. Uh, it's an, a, a cracking charity that can help offer support. And you'll see from this interview that that's what it's about a lot of the time, support uh, and talking. And But don't let me say it. Let's hear what Paul has to say. I guess I'm going through your head. We had dad home, you know, and it was like dad's home, like it's everything's going to be better. The funeral comes and then after the funeral, that was the hardest moment. What now? People who, want to, who die by suicide don't want to die. And I honestly believe my dad could still be alive if he had that support. If he knew how to talk, if he knew how to open up. So Paul, thank you for, for coming on this, coming on the process. And uh, we had a little chat about the idea of what this is going to be. And I, I just think, I feel really... I feel really lucky and I feel really ignorant <laughs> sitting opposite you about to, to chat to you. And, but I think that's actually a really good thing. I'm hoping that's a really good thing. Hopefully. And I've got some notes here of kind of where I want to go with it and how we can dive into that phrase of the process and the process that you both go through yourself now and also something that you look to share to everyone else. Mm -hmm. But I think, I, I was trying to figure out how do I start this. I felt like that when we're gonna if we're gonna be talking about suicide when we talk about mental health, I think the best way to get to it and get to how it means so much to people and why it's so important that people talk about it, I felt like the, the best place to start was about what your life was like before this whole mm -hmm. thing happened. Tell me a bit about yourself before you lost your dad. Quite normal to be honest. I mean, grew up in Essex as you I know from the accent. Um, I honestly describe it as quite a, no a normal childhood. Older brother, two years older than me. Mum and dad were together. Mum and dad were married. Lived in a three bedroom house, which upgraded to a four bedroom house as we got a little bit older. So okay at school, quite popular at school, liked football. I was in the football team at school. Typical kind of, you know, just quite a normal yeah. upbringing. And, um, it's funny you go to that word. Yeah. Because I was thinking about this as well. And what I've found with these interviews I've been doing is I go to words. And so as we go along, you know, the process is one, of course. Uh, relationships is one I want to talk about. Bereavement is definitely one I want to talk about. But normal was one that, that popped into my head. Because mm. what do you think when you, when you think of the word normal with the life that you've had? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, just a, a prejudgment of, of life as well in... You know, for, for me, again, looking back, it was normal, but that's just the real outside perspective. Like, actually, I was quite insecure. I was always looking for approval from others. You know, I was always the guy taking the piss out of everyone because right. I was insecure. And, you know, looking back from the outside perspective, I remember one guy in class, I think I was about year, I don't know, year nine, year 10, sort of said to me, Paul, your life's perfect. You've got, you know, 
good looking girlfriend at school, in the football team, you know, mum and dad are together, four bedroom house. And as soon as he said that, it didn't resonate with me at all. I was like, my, li- my life isn't perfect at all. Yeah. Like, I wasn't feeling like it was. Um, but yeah, kind of all the way up to 18, when I say normal, it was more following the rules. Like going to school, went to college, came out of college, was gonna go to university, but started a job, willing to work up the corporate ladder, make more money. Yeah. Um, yeah, went on a few, one lads holiday. But then yeah, at 18, that's kind of when it all changed, sort of when you know, I lost my dad. So. Yeah. And so, so tell me about your dad. Tell me about that period of time. That mm. that eighteenth year of your life is such a it's such a passage into yeah. adulthood, into leaving school or A levels or whatever you're doing or college. It's such a moment for something like that to to happen. Yeah, it was a it was a massive surprise because again, you know, for that first eighteen years, dad was, you know. Had a full-time job, um, you know, it was very loving, wife, friends. It never really showed any emotion, like a little bit. My dad was quite sensitive, but he was... How would you describe your dad? Would you describe him as sensitive? Because I think that's interesting as well when it comes to, to guys. Absolutely. It's not always the guy who comes across sensitive. There's no, yeah. there's no sort of... There's no basic, like, mm. oh, well, you're like that, so then that, then that those kind of problems or mental health issues are going to happen to to you yeah can happen to anyone so he wasn't overly emotive or or no and i think you know i'm writing about this a lot at the moment um sort of working on a book and trying to trace back to um my dad and what i saw is my dad was brought up by my granddad who went through war my granddad's 93 he's still alive um my granddad lost my dad so my dad was an only child and then lost my nan a month later so basically wow. he lost his son and then his wife of over 50 years in a month and never cried, never showed any emotion, um, just kind of got on with it. Not saying that crying is a, just one form of emotion, but it was very, it was very closed off. So I always say this, my dad was brought up by, by him, but also brought up by my nan who was more sensitive. So when me and my brother were growing up, my dad had a bit of both. Mm. So a good example of that is I would give my dad a kiss goodnight, I would hug him goodnight, we were very, you know, he was always Set supportive, up. like, oh yeah, no, very supportive, but there's times when if I had a bad game at football, I would know about it. Right. You know, you were terrible today, da 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 da, and I would be a bit, he said, and he would say, if that was me, granddad would have gone in a lot harder than that, you know, this is light, this is nothing. And he would go from, you know, he would change very quickly. And because of that, I always felt very, controlled by him in a way not controlled but I was always looking to impress him right because I knew that he could change very quickly and I think that was the issue with my dad when it came to that point of he didn't know how to behave he should he have toughened up and acted like my granddad or should he have been more accepting of his emotions open up expressed how he felt and I think that battle caused a lot of it but yeah leading up to it there was no signs no signs of depression no signs of any struggle and it was it was a very quick moment where. He, so what was the day and what what happened? I was I was working so I was working in Iceland the supermarket. Um, yes, just you know part time job and I, I went to see him and um, afterwards I saw him afterwards and his eyes I always explain it as his eyes. So him and my mum had temporarily split up. Okay. So he was at where he was living. Right. So I walked around there and opened the door. I was meeting him after work. And straight away, just this whole change in personality. And I always explain it by his eyes. So his mm. eyes were very distant, very off. And again, I didn't know that at the time, but looking back now, it's the one thing that sticks out in my mind is his eyes. And also what he was saying, he was saying, you know, I'm struggling, you know where the money is, you know where my accounts are. Right. But, you know, just finishing work at Iceland, scanning baked beans and stuff, to then hear that, I didn't understand it. Um, and then yeah then the day that same day or the day after he rang my mum and my mum went and met him in a car park and again he just sort of was very different to her um, so in, as, as someone who, who doesn't truly understand it all and uh, again I think that's a good thing for this conversation because mm. that's all I want to get from it is to have a bit more understanding of it, of, of it for myself and for, for people although ultimately it is quite selfish for, for me but is is that a sign then that that you talk about the eyes that that 
distance that not yeah. being the same is that something that people can can take and can they take that as, as something that if you, they see that in a friend or a family member or whatever that mm. that should be something that they should kind of yeah, be I alert to or? massively I mean again we, did, we didn't know anything we, you know this is you know it happens and we, we've got no idea what this is mm. um, but yeah I just think change in behaviour like you know, sometimes you can just see a change in behaviour, and that's a, a huge sign of that someone's struggling. Yeah. Um, and yeah, my, my dad went to the doctors, told them how he was feeling, and the doctor gave him an antidepressant. You know, try this. Um, my dad was very holistic. So my dad was an athlete. He ran a lot. Um, trained twice a day. Kept very healthy. You know, he had a psychology degree. He had, a, you know, an engineer. He had a part-time business. Had everything on paper, as I always say. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, he finds himself. Sort of really struggling to a day or two later I think it was a day later being prescribed antidepressants so now he's taking antidepressants right and I've explained the story a couple of times and I was speaking to my mum a while ago and I actually got it wrong it was a period of I think five days um, where he started to take these antidepressants didn't work so he went back the doctor said you know double your dose try try that and um, I think it was probably five six days after me seeing him like that, um, he attempted suicide for the first time. And that was like, you know, a massive shock. Yeah. Because, like well, I said- What's going through your head at that moment? It was, it was lack of understanding, so we didn't understand it at all. And we didn't know how to support him. I always say we didn't get told how to support him. You know, we didn't get told that your dad's going through this, he might need this support. And antidepressants, one of the side effects is suicidal thoughts right. in the first two weeks. And they're very strong. That and seems quite contradicting to, to the aim of it. Mm -hmm. Which is why they need, for me, my dad needed that support in that period of time to of monitor him. You know, you can't just go away and start taking these and hope that they work if one of the side effects is suicidal thoughts. And I remember it vividly, you know, my dad, again, so much to to the story but he he rung an ambulance and said I feel very suicidal um, so he was asking for help they came and picked him up took him to our local A&E and um, mum found out that he'd gone to obviously A&E I was at work my brother was at work and, and she was and then all of a sudden um, you know he went missing so me and my brother went driving to A&E and there was an accident on the other side of the road and it's strange because it doesn't really cross your mind but then you, I had this sort of feeling that could it could it have happened like could this have been a case mm. and um because I guess you go to you go to the worst thought you can imagine right? yeah and then but then you think no 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 it's yeah because it's lack of understanding it's like my dad my dad's you know an athlete he's a powerful guy like you know he yeah. seems very content yeah. you know, there's, there's no way that he's going to go and try to take his own life and um and then, yeah, we were, we were ringing, 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 and in the end, a police officer answered. He said, you know, your dad's been in an accident, he's being operated on. Um, and I don't know, this could tr trigger some people, I don't know how deep you want to go into it, but he basically got sat in A&E and left in A&E and didn't get any um, attention. So he got up and walked to a road, sort of stepped in front of a van, and that was his first attempt. Right. And... Um, yeah, again, he should never have survived that first accident. And we always say, me, my mum, my brother, my family, if he died at that instant, it would have been such more of a shock than when he did eventually take his right. life. Because that was like a couple of days between him changing in behaviours to then doing that. Of course, yeah. Um, but yeah, physically he survived that and then came out of hospital you know, a little while later and denied it all. Sort of said, I would never have done that. It was the medication. Right, which we believed. Um, yeah, you know, we believed him. So you don't believe that now? No, no, because because then it happened, and you know, it's was then he came out of hospital, and we thought, okay, yeah, we'll trust him. Mm. Maybe it was. Um, he had a you know a brain operation as well because of the accident, and then you start to question that. Was it that? Was it the brain? You know, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a similar situation where he's that behaviour again. Right. Was um, there a brief period where he? Forgive me for using the wrong, this will be the wrong phrase, I'm sure, but it snapped out of that. Seemed it. Like, it did seem it. We had Dad home, you know, and it was right. like, Dad's home, like, it's everything's going to be better. And then, you know, it was very quickly, the behaviour started to come back again. And, again, I don't know the exact time, but it wasn't long after, 
he's now he now finds himself in a mental health unit so again I didn't even know this existed it's sort of 10 minutes from where I live wow. and behind the hospital that he was in now he's in this sort of mental health unit and, and he's sectioned because you know he was feeling suicidal and then all of that starts and it's it, that was my eye opening to mental health I never understood it Yeah. And now all of a sudden I'm visiting my dad every day in this mental health unit with mentally ill patients yeah and that was an eye opening so. and I get this this is also at a time where this, so this is nine nearly is it ten years yet Getting ten, close, ten right? years in March right yeah I mean yeah ten years in March and I feel like even from then to now the, the conversation has moved forward mm. a decent amount I think it's really getting there, getting further and further. I mean, to the point that where I guess when I saw your when I saw your story on, I saw you on Instagram, and yeah. I was like, I feel com- I felt comfortable enough to reach out to you to go, let's talk about this because I, like I see my my channel and, and it's you know the people, the demographic on it is it's quite clear, and there mm-hmm. are the it the fact that it's men so often. I think that there are so many different stats. Yeah. And I think then get to a point where you keep hearing the same ones and you yeah. go, like, it starts to kind of wash past you. But this, I saw one and it was, I don't know what year it was, but it was saying that 76% of suicides that year were men. Yeah. That I found fascinating because there has to be some sort of, that can't be a, a biological thing. That has to be a societal thing where there are these pressures that mm. men put on themselves. Well, do you agree? I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, massively. I mean, I didn't know these statistics till about two years ago, and I lost my dad. So if I was oblivious to them, as you said, there's more conversation now. But they're scary. I mean, yeah, I think it's seventy-nine percent now are of all suicides are men. In the UK alone, a man takes his own life every two hours. Um, and again, there's, there's so many statistics of that. And the biggest one, the one that always sinks in the most, is um, the biggest killer of men under the age of 50, I think it is now, is, is suicide. No you know, alcohol, no drugs, no... And again, you know, that's else. probably, for me now, that's a big part of mental health. You know, a lot of guys will turn to alcohol because it's that way of numbing their pain. And if you, if you take into consideration all of the people dying from alcoholism, drug you know, abuse as well, you know, the number's huge. Yeah. And the way someone explained it to me is the biggest risk of your life as a man under 50 is yourself like that sinks in yeah we don't take control of this but we should get to to that day where Mm. where um what was your dad's name? Neil. 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 Took the his worst name, name ever. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it could be some Neil's watching this. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Neil. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> um, Neil. Neil the orange pill, we used to say sometimes. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, Neil, obviously, was in denial a little bit about the yeah. first time. Of it. Do you think that denial was true t- to himself? Do you think he believed that? Or do you think he was think just he saying that to you? I think he knew. But I think, again, as a man, you become very ashamed. You know, you become ashamed of feeling depressed not being able to deal with it now all of a sudden you've attempted to take your own life it hasn't been successful Mm. for me if I was in that situation I must you know my dad must have felt very ashamed and again that's the whole society thing isn't it you know he shouldn't have been ashamed because now knowing the statistics so many people suffer with it yeah but at that time I think he does he did feel very ashamed and then like I say now all of a sudden he's in a mental health unit sectioned as they say um and again, I think of me in that situation, now I'm a dad, I think of me in that situation and my children come to visit me, the thoughts racing through my mind must have just been, you know, he must have just thought, you know, I'm kind of done now, like, I find myself here, I don't know where I'm gonna go from this point forward. And yeah, it's a scary it's a scary place, a mental health unit to go to. Yeah, I can imagine. And so the day itself, how did that play out? So my dad was in the mental health unit for, again, I'm not 100% on dates, but it was two months, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so he, you know, got sectioned, as they say, and then all of a sudden you're not allowed out of this sort of ward. We'd go and visit him every day. Then all of a sudden now you're allowed out of there and into maybe the canteen bit, and then it's sort of now you're allowed out, etc. and then right. you've got to come back. Then all of a sudden he gets discharged. And when my dad got discharged, he seemed okay because... You know, he was on medication, he seemed to be improving. Um, and remember, again, vividly, I'm playing football on a Sunday. My dad used to referee, used to help manage my football team, my local Sunday football team. And 
uh, he came and watched me and just having him watch me at that moment was so nice to yeah. sort of have him at the side like kind of watching um, his behaviour again was quite different to what he was used to like but it was like having him back and that's understandable isn't it to, to a point yeah and then there's a key moment where like we all went out for my brother's 21st birthday and um, so my brother's birthday's in February um, my dad died in March and we are all there at dinner sort of me, my mum, my brother, my dad and my nana granddad, very small family and um, he said to my mum well at least I've seen Steve turn 21 very out of the blue because we see, we thought he was doing okay and she sort of said well you're going to see Paul turn 21 as well and um, again warning signs but you don't really pick up on them because again we're so uneducated of course. we didn't know we just thought he was better he's out now he's, he's better um, and then what happened is he, he had a really bad weekend where um, he again became quite strange I went you know he, would, he sort of locked himself in a room and didn't want to come out and I went to up there to sort of see him and he just wanted to get out he was like I need to get out and the scare, that was the scariest moment of his depression because he sort of raised his fist to me and I saw it in his eyes just like rage just yeah. distance and then his eyes kind of changed and then he sat back down on the bed and then he's more rational in his decision um, but yeah anyway we, we called an ambulance he got taken to the hospital um, loads of stuff went wrong again but finally ended up back in the mental health unit over the weekend and um, on the Monday my dad was let out on a physical assessment because there was no one to mentally assess him in a mental health unit and I went to see him um, because he'd, he'd gone to my nan and granddad's and that was the biggest guilt that I've ever had because my dad was wrong he was sort of saying things like I'm never going to be the same dad again but it was a six month period and this sounds quite selfish but I was so mentally drained from just everything I didn't understand it yeah. that I thought he's going to be okay I went to work on the Tuesday I ring up my granddad how's dad um, he's fine I ring up again how's dad he's gone for a walk I knew then that that was it I thought that's it he's, he's, I reckon he's going to do it um, I left work that's came. such a horrible um, yeah, day to day it's horrible feeling I'd imagine in your gut that you've got to go and you have that you're like you're thinking oh is it this is it that that's hot that's so yeah, that's it was so because tough. You're, 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 I was worrying at work leading up to it and then oh yeah he's fine he's just you know and I thought oh what? you know okay step step closer and yeah. then how is he he's gone for a walk um, and yeah it's almost like you know but then you don't want to know so you, your mind's all over the place of course yeah so I ring my mum ring my brother we all kind of leave work to come and find him because I rang again an hour later and he hadn't come back so that was when we all started to panic right. um, and then yeah what sort of happened is we were all at my nan and granddad's can't find him and um, my brother and granddad went to the um, police station with a photo and they identified that he'd had uh, an accident um, and yeah I never, I never forget that moment because my brother and granddad came back from the police station and just sort of said you know it's dad um and I, just, I cried massively but then as a man like, I was just punching stuff just just hitting stuff and like why like you know, all those sort of questions go through yeah. your mind but then as we kind of touched on a couple of hours later me and my brother in a fish and chip shop ordering our dinner and no one knows what's just happened to you like no one there did knows. you find solace in that? It's, it's the strangest feeling because in your mind you're like trying to battle with it but then you have to find some normality to keep going yeah so like we're all in fish and chips and you're not hungry at all but it's like we need some normality whilst trying it's trying to process the first night's horrible and then the next morning I think me and mum walk the dog and everyone's like morning not having no idea that you know her husband my dad has just took their own life yeah. and yeah it's I wouldn't wish it on anyone to be honest it's, no. it's horrible what what strikes me with this whole thing and it's you kind of touched on it yourself in your own little way in terms of the bereavement afterwards and and we'll get into the anxiety that you've had to deal with and things like that in a sec but what it feel, what feels so different with this and I, I think it's difficult for people to understand both um, from a perception point of view but also from a a moment when you're going through it is that you cannot see it yeah you can't there's no bruise there's yeah. no there's, there's the only signals that you can have is uh, tweaks on behaviour yeah and that can be hidden if you want it to be right yeah. 
and, and that's, that's the hardest thing with it and it's you know another example of that is when my dad came out of that unit and we thought he was doing better he was keeping a diary and we read that diary after he died and everything that he wrote was conflicting of what we thought so where we thought he was he went golf with one of his friends and his friend was like yeah you know he was Neil he was fine yeah, yeah. Um, in the diary it was like went golf felt terrible didn't want to be here didn't want to be there and like you say it's one of those things that's so hard to see mm. I had a lot of anger towards the way he was treated but then accepted a lot of that because of exactly that you know my dad told them on that day I just want to be at home with my family yeah. I just want to go home I feel okay I mean, he's such a smart guy who understands psychology as well. Yeah. But there are tricks that you can... Yeah, and I think if you want to do it, you, you find a way of getting out. You yeah. know? And I think it's, you know, for my dad, I think he was always set on it. And, and I, the human, that's human nature as well that you go... Sometimes you go, I had a really shit day. I need... To, well, hang on. I need to just get through that day or put up that shield or yeah. whatever it is to get you through it. And so that, that's human nature for people to do that, isn't it? Yeah. And then, and then it's, I started to ask the question of, like, was my whole life knowing my was my whole relationship with my dad a lie because it's like what was he battling that I didn't see that my mum didn't see my mum was with him since she was 15 like that was her first love her only love yeah. and I don't know whether she felt the same but for me it was like was this whole thing like did I just misjudge have my dad have you spoken dad? to her about that a little bit yeah and like she struggled we all struggled with to deal with it all in our different ways yeah. as well and um yeah it's, it's a, and, and for me the biggest battle that I had was how do I grieve because as a man, an 18 year old, nearly 19 year old, I wanted to show that strong face. I went clubbing, I think six days after, because I text one of my friends, where are we going tonight then? And they're like, you know, you don't have to come yeah. out. And I remember a guy from college at the time sort of approached me, heard about the story, he knew of my dad from football. I was like, why are you here? Like, why are you here? And I'm like, I'm okay, it's fine, I just wanna have fun. That's yours. That's you that's wanting a, a moment of escape, right? Yeah, and it's, it's not just me putting up that front now. So yeah. I'm doing exactly the same <laughs> as what my dad did, and it's just. Um, but this, the hardest thing for me was to grieve because I felt like my dad made that decision. So I wasn't grieving over someone who had died and didn't want to die. I was trying to grieve over someone who died but chose to die. Yeah. So that was so hard because I'm like, do you feel like he, he did that to you? Originally, yeah, because period. again, you know, I went through whole loads of stages of anger towards him, um, struggling to forgive him for what he's done to me, my mum, and seeing my mum struggle is then like always, you know, that's dad's fault, and not understanding it, not under yeah. still not understanding depression, suicide, and, and that was the sort of process I had to go through to understand why he did it, so then I could sort of have some release. So what are those first, what I wanted to get for, for people to kind of, to take in themselves when these things happen because you know death is inevitable death in this circumstance is, is, is so tragic how how did those first few weeks then I, I, I was fine with, with the few instances I've had to, to deal with death so there's this kind of the funeral's almost helpful to a point because there's like a there's something to get to yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's things to organise there's people to call you've yeah. got to do all that stuff but then once that's done, then there's this, yeah. then what? That's it. So what was, what was it like for you for that those first six months and then there on? What's yeah, I mean, that, exactly that. I mean, the same with me is it's, because of, you know, my dad was an accident, you had police involved, you had an inquest, you had journalists that wanted to, you know, talk about it, like local journalists. Yeah. So you've got all of that. And then it's telling, I tell one of my best friends who then tells my friends, then You've got friends, you know, is everything all right? Chatting to you all the time. Yeah. Funeral arrangements. The funeral comes, and then after the funeral, that was the hardest moment because, like you said, it's like, what now? The support dries up. Again, not that you're, you know, not that that's their fault, but all of a sudden, life moves on. Yeah. And it's now, okay, what do I do? What do I deal with? How do I deal with it? Do I act normal? Do I just go back to living the life that I was living? Or And how do you find that support? when I think often people they don't they don't know how to be mm. how did you how did yeah, did you find yourself kind of thinking I oh, I would love my mates but I would love them as it normally is yeah. not this kind of I would imagine their behaviour to you would have been good slightly different good question yeah I think, I think that's spot on I think at the funeral it was very much again you know we pulled up at the funeral and the car park was closed because it was so busy really? and my dad 
sort of had so many friends, again, talking about mental health, like why didn't he reach out to one of them? He didn't feel like he could. Um, people were standing, you know, a lot of my friends were there because they knew him from football. And yeah. um, and at the, at the funeral, it was kind of weird because I didn't like that awkwardness. It's on you as well. But your mates are looking guy, at you right? and you're like trying yeah, to, yeah. you don't want them to kind of, but that's me at 18. Like now it wouldn't bother me, but at 18, I just wanted that normality. And then at the other wake afterwards, we kind of rented a sort of bar. And we wanted it to be a bit of a celebration because of my dad and- um, yeah, cool. But yeah, you end up just falling back into just you drinking and like trying to have some normality of your friends rather than sitting there and actually having a deep conversation about it. It's almost like, let's just distract. And that's what I did. I, I distracted myself for probably about two years. Didn't um, started a business, so I started an online business, went all in at work, every hour of every day, kind of just like, boom, in the laptop, wanna, wanna be successful, want this, make dad proud, um, gloving, drinking, buying stuff, like just, you know, clothes. That's also cards. being 18 to 20. Yeah, something, exactly. Yeah. I, mean, it's a part of, I think that's a big part of it. Um, but it's a pivotal do moment. Do you think, you know, were there moments to yourself where you were kind of like, I, I'm going a bit, I'm going a bit far with the work, I'm going a bit like, and, and you knew that it was, that it was that? No. Or, no. It's, it's only like looking back, you realise that's what I was doing. Right. Um, and, you know, the pivotal moment came because sort of two years later, I just, again, I, I went to the doctors, doctors was like, you're, you're suffering with depression. I ran away from that diagnosis because um, I didn't want to be labelled like my dad. Um, one of my biggest fears, it still is, is that my, I would end up like my dad. Yeah. Because I was always compared to him. You're so like your dad. You look like your dad. You're sporty like your dad. You're like your dad. And then all of a sudden, that happens to your dad and you're questioning, is that going to happen to me? Mm. So I went to the doctor saying I felt fatigued. He was like, I think you're suffering with depression. And I was no way. No, I'm not suffering with depression. And I ran away from it. Which, looking back, was a blessing because um, I didn't accept it. I wanted to get better. And um, for me personally, that worked. A lot of people do like that closure. But for me... The closure I, of... The I diagnosis. Have, yeah, I have yeah. this. Whereas I was like, I don't, I don't want to be labelled as that. Right. And also as well, I don't know whether it was depression or just so much... You know, grief symptoms and depression is very similar. So I don't know whether I was just grieving and not knowing. Um, but yeah, just, just, just distractions until you find you're in a place where you're struggling to get out of bed and you're struggling to find any kind of purpose and you're trying to find that next hit like okay maybe I'll go out and get drunk or maybe I'll go and buy something but it's not as effective as it was sort of at the beginning right um, so yeah that's kind of how I dealt with it early on and so do you think what was the what was the healer for you what what, what, what got you past that point mm. Again, I think those distractions helped because especially work, you know, I started to enjoy work. I wanted to create freedom. So I wanted to create like an online business that you see it, like working on the beach. Like, this is me, I'm making loads of money. That's, I got drawn towards that because I wanted to, my dad was a very nine to five work until I retire kind of, you know, man. Right. Um, so I, those distractions helped me kind of probably keep going. But what helped me the most was, was, was talking. Um, I, I saw a counsellor on the GP and it didn't work. I, I just couldn't open up to her. Right. Um, I think I saw like a psychiatrist again. Didn't really work. Couldn't open up to her. And is um, that because of them or was that because you weren't ready? I don't know. Probably both. Yeah. You know, I couldn't. I didn't feel like I could relate to them. And at the same time, I felt like they were trying to talk more about how I was feeling rather than answering the questions that I wanted answering. So I was there probably trying to find out what had happened to my dad, why has this happened? Right. Whereas they were trying to deal with like me, which I didn't really relate to. And then um, I met Amy, who's now my wife, and she had a friend called Michelle, and Michelle was going to see this lady. Um, and I had back problems. So this is sort of me, maybe two years later after dad, and you know, getting on with life. Yeah. And I started to have back problems from sitting down too much, I, believe, I believed. I went to see you know, acupuncture, chiropractor, and then all of a sudden, um, Amy and Michelle were talking about this lady called Anne, and they said, you know, she gives massage, she um, takes donations, so you can literally put money in a pot, you know, you haven't got to spend 60 quid. And then they went, she's really, really weird. Like, she knows <laughs> more stuff about you than you know about yourself. Right. And Through this, your body. I don't know. They're just like, she's weird. She's like a witch. They're <laughs> like a witch. Yeah. She's Not like a 65-year-old witch. 
It's the first day I'm like, wow, I'm going to get a massage and give yeah. donations. Yeah, where I'm do I so sign? <laughs> yeah. Then all of a sudden I find out she's a 65 year old witch, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. I don't really want a massage, but I want to find out more about this woman. Like, so um, I found myself booking an appointment, and it's this funny like situation. It's like this little bungalow near to where I live. You walk in, she goes, yeah, go in that room. It's like on the right. All the curtains are closed. Like, music's playing, like the weirdest music you can imagine. Anyway, first session. You know, my back hurts. You know. This is why. She gave me a massage, recommended a chiropractor. Second session, I think it was. Um, I think the same happened. Third session, she was like, why are you here? And I was like, I've got a back problem. <laughs> I'm here for a massage. She was like, why are you really here? And I just broke. Like, I just you know, burst into tears. And I was just, I said to her something along the lines of, um, my dad killed himself. I don't know how to deal with it. And I was just, I was gone. Like, why her? It's, it's so strange, but I think I was drawn towards her weirdness. Um, she was very spiritual, and I could just open up to her. She didn't force it, right. whereas every other one person seemed to force it. Like they wanted to talk about it. Here I am, going to see this lady not talking about it, and I want to talk about it. Right. That's so, fascinating. Yeah, so then I found myself just opening up to her. Yeah, honestly, she, she was a massive help to me because she would then give me a book, for example. I would read this book. 21 I'm now reading a book on like spirituality like what is this yeah, like, yeah. I don't understand it give it back like that doesn't make sense like, that doesn't, that's not true and then she'd give me another book and I'd read that give me another book and then months pass she gives me the original book and now all of that makes more sense and I went to see her like every week and she just made me really understand like dad why it happened why I'm feeling this way and you know the main thing that she helped me with is forgiveness like forgiving him and also forgiving myself because there's so much guilt around suicide forgiveness I think is uh, it feels like a massive part of it for the people that are left behind mm. um, how did you get there? with time and she explained it to me I, I still see her I don't see her as much as I used to but you know I didn't see her for I think six months because I'm like I'm handling this you know I'm good I'm, I'm doing this mental health stuff I'm good and then I went to see her a couple of weeks ago because I felt like I was Client. I was taking on a lot of people's problems basically and um, just speaking to her again I come out and I'm like a, I feel so much different and that's it though it doesn't end does it yeah it and never ends you're end. always learning and yeah. um, she explained it to me the other, the other week she said not all therapy but most therapy that what she sees it as is the first stage is understanding um, so the questions that she would ask was all in a way of trying to get me to understand and to open now the issue that a lot of people have is that's the most dangerous stage because now it's almost like you've opened up the wounds right. and that's when you're at your most vulnerable okay. so I remember coming out of that session crying, crying, crying and then feeling really, really bad like the, probably the worst I've been so did you, at that moment did you feel like it had done more harm than good? kind of yeah. but then there's also a little bit of me that was you know, smiling a little bit and a little bit excited because I felt like this is the person that could help me um so yeah, you're now like an open wound. So now you've got to try and you know heal it in some way. And again, this is all naturally done. But she explained to me the other day. Then comes forgiveness. So you know we're all of our the same with my dad. I started to understand that obviously my dad had a lot of past issues mm. that we never knew about, we never saw. But he's kind of buried them, and that's why the breakdown was so quick because all of a sudden it all comes back, and he can't accept that. He can't deal with it. Um, like I always say, my my dad worked every hour of every day like ran like always was busy and now I see that as he was just distracted yeah. like, he didn't want to deal with just like you started doing as well yeah exactly I didn't know I, don't, I still don't know to this day what it was but obviously something that's happened in the past that's caused him to have that, that emotion and um, then yeah it's, it's like forgiveness so now I have to start trying to work on that so understand it but then also forgive him forgive myself um, and start to deal with it the one question I was going to ask was like how Everyone go. Everyone's there's a lot of people going. We need to talk about this, right? And I, I start going. Well, if you've got so much going on your in your mind, how, where do you start? Yeah, I wasn't forced to talk. That's why it helped me. Well, yeah, and and Does that make what sense? I found quite interesting about what you were saying just before was that that the answer was conversation again each time. So you had a bit of conversation. It didn't matter who it was with. It just had to be the right person at mm. the right time and there were people that it didn't work with and so I think for people 
who would be going through that kind of thing, it might not be mum. It yeah. might not be you know your best mate. It might be just yeah. the person you can kind of find and have that connection with. But the important thing is that you just keep trying to find yeah. that person. And then you talk about the understanding and how that made you feel worse. Mm. The, the solution to that was more converse, more conversation. Yeah. This is the whole thing with mental health. Is there's no one size fits all. You know, a lot of people would say you've got to talk to someone. But for some men, that's not good for them. You know, some, like my granddad's 93. He's seen his best friends, you know, die in front of him at war. He's seen his son, his wife. You know, 93 now, he's, you know, he's deteriorating. And now I'm starting to see more emotion, um, more than I've ever seen. But, like, his resilience caused him to, you know, live to 93. Yeah. So... I think there's no one size fits all and I see stuff now and again I used to like it but now I don't about you know men should cry like yes if you want to cry cry but don't force it because yeah. then you start, you start judging yourself for not being able to cry and you're like am I really insensitive like you know so if someone who doesn't want to talk what what would you what would you say to them how do they find their way around it I think like you say you know the reason why people don't like to talk is they can't find the person to talk to um, the reason why I opened up to Anne is because she was so relatable. She wasn't a trained counsellor. She wasn't a trained psychologist. I didn't feel like she was judging me in any way. Um, and, you know, I think she went on a weekend holistic therapy course and that's all she ever had. But what Anne had was a very hard childhood, a very hard life. And she'd learned so much from that. Right. So now all of a sudden um, I could relate to her. So the same with me. So now when I do some videos... Um, I had a meet up like at the weekend people come up to me and they say I feel like I can I feel like I know you I feel like I can talk to you because I can relate to you like yeah so I think with talking it's finding someone you can relate to so another example of that talking about men is one of a guy from school lost his dad to suicide and you hear it and you're like that's really sad and then life moves on then all of a sudden I think maybe a year later I think it was my dad died of suicide the first person I reach out to is him on MSN Messenger back in yeah. the day, but it was like, I wanted someone to talk to who knew what yeah, I was going yeah, through. Yeah. So I think that's the key thing. But also as well is, there's so many other avenues of doing it. You know, finding something you're passionate in, or I like to journal, I like to write things down, I like to um, process things that way as well. You know, people use music, people use, you know, even football. Like there's so many different methods of coping. Yeah. It's not just all about talking, but everyone's different. If someone's having suicidal thoughts, what would you, what would be the process for, for them? What would you say to them to do? Yeah, I think it's such a hard question because like, we'll never truly understand the situation that they're in or like the headspace they're in. And what I found recently is um, I talk about my dad's story and I talk about my understanding of my dad's story, but I'll never truly understand where he was at. I'll never ever truly understand what was going through his mind to cause him to do what he did. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what's helped people that I've spoke to in the past get through those times, and I honestly believe my dad could still be alive if he had that support, if he knew how to talk, if he knew how to open up or um, get the recovery that he needed, was for me, it's all about hope. It's all about having some hope or some meaning in your life to keep going. Mm. So people would look at my dad and say, yeah, but he had everything. Like he had, and all of, all of the most... There's a lot of celebrity suicides that we now see. And the big yeah. question that everyone asks is why? Like they've got everything that we dream of having. Like why do they do it? And they lose that perception of what they have. So for everyone looking in, they've got a lot. But for them, their perspective of what they've got is very little. Yeah. So I think when they talk about trying to save someone in that situation, it's trying to give them a glimmer of hope. Like even if it's the smallest glimmer of hope, whether that's telling them about their kids or how much they mean to them or you know trying to create some bit yeah. of hope to get them through that moment because someone explained it to me that when you're suicidal every day you wake up with a battle of should I live another day or should I end it that's the only question that you battle with and I think if you can get a glimmer of hope every so often yeah it and it's as simple maybe as just saying I'm here mm. I'm here yeah whenever you need right to yeah. have those conversations or not have those conversations you yeah. just sit down you just go for a walk any of those things I think what's a real shame and it's something that you're looking to do which I think is fantastic is that there needs to be more examples of people who have t dealt with it tackled it and 
and there's there's a good story at the yeah, end of yeah, it as well. Yeah. It feels like I was thinking to myself, if someone's having suicidal thoughts, then you think that's you know, is that are you near the end of something? Your mm. life? It's not actually. It yeah. can be if it can be spun and looked at a different way. It can actually just right. You know, you're having these thoughts now. Yeah, that's the that's the starting point of going. Okay, then what are the coping mechanisms to kind of deal with them? And I know I'm saying that from someone who's kind of thinking logically and I think that's that's a good mistake for me to make as well because I think a lot of people go like you say well, why was he doing why is he thinking that what's going through his mind it is a health issue yeah like grandma she had she had problems she was suicidal she tried to commit suicide a few times um but she you know she was able to kind of battle through it thanks a lot to my, my mum who and her husband who as well who never had any of those issues but they were there and supportive and, and all of those things that she was able to live till she was you know mid 80s when I talk to my mum about it sometimes that that kind of that, the person who's not going through those things to understand that it's did you get any understanding from it like did you understand did you speak to like your grandma about it I talked to um, no I never spoke to a grandma but I spoke to my I would talk to my mum about it sometimes and she would just go she would she totally understands that that's not that's not them right now mm. so you've just got to be patient and you've just got to be there mm. and my nan would go to my mum all the time she'd go I'm, I'm never going to get better I'll never get better and mum would just go you, you will get better you will get better and she for a while she'd be going is this the one where I say it and it's just like everything's fine again Yeah. and it ne- never was but in time was it always a kind of so she she, she had 10 year periods where she was fine and then she'd have five year periods where she where she wasn't mm. and so it is it's a constant thing but it, it is it is a health issue it's yeah. not I think it's just so confusing for people because they can't see it yeah and I think it's that whole thing like you say it's a long term recovery like you know I'm still always trying to feel better and the issue is is we have these like my dad my dad just wanted to feel better you know and and they always say someone who dies by suicide doesn't want to die they just want the pain to stop and they just want to get out of that pain mm. and the way i see it now and you know i go into a lot more details in terms of how i reflected it in the book um i don't know how deep i want to take this but my dad's my dad died by walking in front of a lorry and physically the pain there was less worry of the pain he was going through mentally yeah and um you hear of like stories of people jumping off bridges and some people have saved them and their body is like a feather they're so lightweight because all of a sudden it's like they've let go and in one of my in one of the statements of my dad it said that he was smiling um at the end and that was so hard to handle at the time but now you reflect on that and it made me realize how in pain he was yeah like how much pain must have you been going through mentally to do that? And like you say, people you know, I said people who want to who die by suicide don't want to die. And it's that long term thing. And it's a constant battle of someone says one percent better every single day. Just try and get a little bit better every day and you're gonna start to come up and then you will come down and then it's about trying to get back on that path. Um, but yeah, it's so hard to it's so hard to deal with. Yeah. And you know, antidepressants for me, you know, it's like I see I saw a newspaper is a sun anyway, this is not the greatest, but um it said pop more happy pills was the front page and it was about how um tests have shown that people should be taking more antidepressants and I think um I think mine told me that a million prescriptions for antidepressants are prescribed every week. That's the judgment that we have for antidepressants though, that we can take it and we'll That's feel it. better. Yeah which is causing a massive issue because like you say it's this like your grandma it's a long life battle mm. and just trying to get better sort of every day if you can one question I'm going to ask everyone um, and I'm fascinated to hear your answer is what keeps you up at night now amazing not much because I'm a pretty good sleeper to be honest <laughs> <kidding>. um, <laughs> so you're a dad yourself now yeah so I wondered if that might have, have some place some part in it massively I think um so I met Amy, Amy had Freddie, so Freddie's my stepson, um, but I met him when he was nearly two. So um, me and Amy were sort of dating for nine sort of months. I didn't want to 
be a dad. I was 21. She didn't want me to meet him. She's very protective. And then all of a sudden, me and her got very serious. And it was just a natural it's what thing. It is. So yeah. Can't um, get out of the way of that. Unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, looking at looking back at that, again, I go into a lot more information uh, in the book is um, I battled with a lot of that because I was 21, 22, 23. Now I'm in a, like a serious relationship and a stepdad, mm. but I'm still going out with my mates and trying to be yeah. that lad. And you know, I might, I got, a, I had a big ego, like a massive ego. So I was very, like torn. Right. And um, you know, we had a break, and then I came back, and I understood that's what I wanted. And I think him and her came at an amazing time because I was all over the place, and what she had was maturity. So like when I lost my dad, she was she was pregnant. And she'd just given birth to, to Freddie. So she right. was she gave birth at 19. So we had two different lives. Yeah. She came in my life and she gave me a bit of stability because she was very mature. Um, so I always say now, so Freddie is now nine. Um, and we now have Teddy. Never ever call your sons Freddie and Teddy. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds cute, but I'm like 28 getting their names wrong already. So I, yeah. you know, I can't imagine what I'm going to be like when I'm older. I'm like, well, one of you again, are you Freddie or Teddy? Um, he's two. Right. And honestly, you know, they say it all the time, like life changes when you're a dad and you don't really understand it, but it does because it gives you, you have more meaning. Yeah. For me, the, the, the thing that keeps me up at night is them now in a way, because... Literally. <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. <laughs> I used to have an amazing morning routine before I had a newborn and then like you try and get up at five in the morning and he's up at like half four and you're like, uh, suicide's the biggest killer of young people as well. And I've now been hearing stories of you know parents that have lost their children to suicide mm. and explained how it makes them feel in fact of how they missed it um, in, f- in the way of them not knowing that their kids were going through that pain um, and I struggled to deal with losing my dad to it I could never imagine losing one of them to it which yeah. is a big driver for me of what I do is because I want them to be able to get the help that they need if they needed to it and also as well for me to be open with them to hopefully show them that you know do talk about it do be open do you know if you are struggling you know please say yeah because the support isn't really there for children and you know young social adults media now. social media is frightening yeah. isn't it because I think that right at the start I think we were talking about it about you supposedly having the perfect life mm. you would tell someone said that to you when you are at school and that comparison, I, I I was thinking growing up, I didn't really compare myself to anyone. And I think the first person I compared myself to was Wayne Rooney. Yeah. He was like 16. Well, your mate at football it. is better than you or something. Yeah. Like that. Why, Why am I not like him? He's 16. I'm three months. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, um, you could be 12, and if you don't go to the, the right, if you're not invited to the party, yeah. it wasn't before that like, you didn't know. Everyone's talking about it and, and, and sort of putting it in your face. And I think that's so. There needs to be new processes for these kids yeah. to be able to deal with that kind of rejection and also the false narrative of what everyone's yeah. putting forward, right? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I've, I've built a career on social media, so there's a lot of... And also the stuff I do in mental health, none of that could be there without social media, but there's so many negatives to it. You know, like you say, one, it's everyone's highlight reel. You know, these kids are scrolling through, seeing someone, thinking that they're happy... You know, they're not going to post a picture of them unhappy. No. Um, and comparing their lives to it, and also the other the other thing that I see a lot of is, you know, if you're at school and you're getting bullied, you have that release at home. Now you don't have that release at home. You know, that bullying can continue yeah. all the way through. The chemical thing it's doing to to oh, us yeah. is, it, I feel it. I feel it myself. Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. it when I go to my phone. Why am I going to my phone? I don't need to. Yeah. It's very dangerous. You know, there's studies now that show that it's the most addictive. You know, think social media. Mm. You get a hit of dopamine every time you, you get, get a like. like. Yeah. It's just scary, and um, yeah, the kids have kids have got to deal with that. And yeah, that's my that's what keeps me up at night. And also as well, like, I, I don't think I would now because I understand the pain that I went through. Um, I would never want them to go through it. Like, you know, and that kind of keeps me going in a way. It's like I never to would want. Yourself. Yeah, I never would want them to to experience. You know, me dying by suicide. Yeah. Um, which has definitely helped with that fear of ending up like my dad mm. is now having them because I don't want them to go through it well can I just say I just think for, for something that's so difficult and such a negative for you to now turn that into what you do and you've mm. turned it into a positive you are affecting people's lives and making them 
aware and more knowledgeable of what they're doing. I think it's an amazing thing. Thank I think you, yeah, Teddy and Freddie are very lucky. Yeah. You're their right dad, mate. Teddy. It's honestly it's a, a pleasure to meet you. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, man. Um, that it. was the process of Paul McGregor. Check out the links I've put in the description. His website, his YouTube channel as well. Go subscribe because he talks about all sorts. And as you've seen by the lovely shirt and hair, <laughs> a bit of style to him as well. <laughs> yeah. So go and check that out as well. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, then click the like button and subscribe to my channel. And also, who do you want me to talk to next? Let me know in the comments below. We'll see you soon. So it was an incredibly difficult time in my life. I didn't realise it was a homophobic slayer for a start. <sighs> That's a fucking hard question. Red men TV aren't selling the souls. Yeah. Back yourself, no one else is going to.